and we're going to talk about something that isn't related to the, to the broader American economy, children's books. Specifically, we're going to talk about weird children's fantasy novels by the author Roald Dahl, which were recently subject to edits by sensitivity readers. There were words removed, uh, phrases changed, in some cases whole sentences added to make Dahl's work supposedly less offensive. Obviously, I'm going to call this segment The Horse You Rolled In On. Dahl, of course, is the famous author of uh, uh, books like Matilda, James and the Giant Peach. He died um, decades ago, uh, and his works are now owned by the Road Dahl Publishing Group, which in 2021 announced they would proceed with a number of adaptations on Netflix. This year, Dahl's publisher, Puffin Books, worked with an outside consultant, uh, a group called Inclusive Minds, to make changes to the text of his book. The edited versions uh, removed words like fat, ugly, and crazy. In other cases, small details were changed. In The Witches, for example, women characters were, uh, who were, uh, became top scientists and business owners. Previously, they had been cashiers in a supermarket. The, the edits made gender-specific terms gender-neutral. They omitted references to mothers and fathers, and in general, focused on descriptions related to weight, gender, race, and ethnicity. Robbie, I know you have written and, uh, and thought an awful lot about these issues. Um, this is just the latest example of so-called sensitivity readers um, being brought in to edit works intended for young readers. Give us some background here. Just ground us in what's going on. How pervasive is this? How does it play out behind the scenes? Does it worry you? Uh, it worries me greatly, and it, it also worried Raul Dahl himself. I want to uh, read a, to you a quote from him. He said this, I've warned my publishers that if they later on so much as change a single comma in one of my books, they will never see another word from me, never, ever. And he said, when I am gone, if that happens, then I'll wish mighty Thor knocks very hard on their heads with his Mjolnir. That's the hammer, if you've seen the, the Marvel movies. I've seen them all. Uh, I assume the statement was made before the Marvel movies. Or, uh, he, yes, or, he says, I will send along the enormous crocodile to gobble them up. This is the fate of... Roald Dahl thought should uh, should await the censors of his material. Um, so how would the sensitivity readers rewrite sure. that? <laughs> <laughs> a uh, can, can we say enormous? Because uh, we can't say fat, so maybe we can't say enormous. A hefty crocodile, a, a crocodile of size. How about that? Um, so this is this problem with the sensitivity readers really is quite pernicious. Um, so many uh, new writers, young writers, are subjected to this ridiculous group of people who purport to have expertise pertaining to identity, race, gender, sexuality, etc. Um, but oftentimes they have no expertise whatsoever. They just, they just happen to fit that category. Kat Rosenfeld is a wonderful writer. She's a writer of young adult fiction. She also writes for Reason on occasion. And she had a great piece for us on this, um, describing the plight of this young author who is writing a book about uh, an African-American man who had been uh, formerly incarcerated or prosecuted, just fiction book, trying to uh, make it at a university. And the author was assumed to be black, but it turned out he was Filipino. So the publisher at the last minute was like, wait, wait, you're not black? Okay, we have to have someone who's black read this book then. And they got like a lady who was British, uh, who, who was black, but like she has no understanding of an incarcerated young African-American adult. Uh, it makes no sense to have her weighing in on this. And this is what awaits so many authors now, is having these if people who for totally surface reasons supposedly should be able to weigh in on this. Um, Lionel Shriver, another author um, who has uh, written for Reason, or be you, Catherine, you did a great interview with her a while back, author of the book uh, What to Do, uh, uh, We Need to Talk About Kevin? That was what it's called. She has written so persuasively, I think, about why this is a bad thing for free expression, for, for intellectual diversity, uh, forcing authors to only narrowly write about their own experience, I mean, that's, a, that's an attack on the very idea of writing and journalism and all of it. You're supposed to persuasively write uh, about other people's experiences, with some knowledge, of course. If you do a bad job of it, you should be criticized. But that should be up to the authors, not these, not these sensitivity readers. Even more than that, I think it, it's an attack on empathy. It's an attack on the idea that you can under, that someone can understand an experience that is not their own. Uh, my favorite story about sensitivity readers was the guy who worked as a sensitivity reader for a publication for a, a publishing house, and then he, of course, wrote his own young adult fiction novel, which got unpublished 
because of sensitivity readers who said, no, no, you can't publish this. Uh, so Nick, I, I wanna ask you here, this is the, the thing where I sometimes struggle with this issue as a libertarian. We have seen authors like Salman Rushdie call, this, uh, call, the, call the rolled doll edits censorship. Uh, we've seen a general outcry about this sort of editing, but this is a private company making changes to works where it owns the rights. I understand the argument. I, I in fact, uh, you know, I like, in, in some ways, like, I buy the argument that it is a kind of censorship, but also, isn't it just a byproduct of property rights being passed down over the years? I mean, sometimes the guy down the block is gonna build an ugly addition on his house, and it's gonna really make the neighborhood look terrible. Do you think this is fundamentally different? I don't think we're supposed to say ugly anymore, Peter. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I also want to, as I always do, because I'm a Roald Dahl hater from way back, um, I want to point out that he is a raging anti-Semite. And it's kind of fascinating that this latest turn of events has kind of taken the light off of that. But he, if Robbie was quoting from him, here's a quote that he said, um, there's a trait in the Jewish character that does provoke animosity. I mean, there's always a reason why anti-anything crops up anywhere, even a stinker like Hitler didn't just pick on them for no reason. Um, so, and that, that, came out, that came out in the 90s. I mean, it was, <laughs> Ro, Roald Dahl, by his own account, was a, a tremendously awful human being, and it doesn't change what's happening here, which is screwed up, uh, and I think is, is not wrong, because you're right, this is his literary estate, in the same way that Dr. Seuss's literary estate can do whatever they want, including not publishing things. I think what is particularly disturbing about this is it's really memory-holing stuff. Um, and Cad Rosenfield, again, who Robbie mentioned, uh, wrote a great essay for us about this. Um, and uh, what there are stealth edits. You know, we, we've written about the uh, 1619 Project where mistakes or changes get made without anybody knowing. This kind of thing happens. It happened, uh, you know, ironically to Ray Bradbury, the author of Fahrenheit 451, the version of that book that most of us probably read if you grew up in the 70s uh, was a bolterized edition that he didn't know that his publisher had changed words in it to make it more palatable for high school audiences. Yeah, it was and he specifically for school children. Yeah, and he flipped out when he heard that and he, he made Valentine you know, publish the actual book uh, when he found out about it. And what's interesting here, and again, this isn't a, a, a direct contradiction, of what we're talking about here, but when you, as we shift to uh, electronic media, and Kat Rosenfeld has talked about this, we, you don't actually own the media in the same way. It's one thing if you downloaded a song or a file onto your computer, but if you're reading it through Kindle or through a variety of other things, you are licensing the right, to, or you're buying a license to read that through that, but Amazon owns it, and Amazon actually can completely vaporize your collection of works. They can change things and update text with all sorts of things without telling you. And Cad Rosenfeld has talked, I think, very persuasively about this, that that may or may not be a good idea in any given circumstance, but the fact that we're not aware of it or thinking about it or noting it is troubling because, you know, this without going full Orwell or full Bradbury, you know, it's a, it's a good idea to understand the editing process because we're constantly revising ourselves, the stories we tell about ourselves, the stories that we share with our children, et cetera. And one of the issues here is that it's not just that books are being censored or edited after the fact. It's that authors uh, are, are, are self-censoring. And there is a chilling effect here in, in which authors feel like they can't write about certain topics, they can't write in certain ways. Uh, Catherine, I actually want to ask you the mom question now. Mm. We're, we're gonna, gotta we're, be we, like we that. We did get there eventually. You have kids in the uh, target age range for road doll books, right? So how do you think about this as a parent? Are sensitivity readers actually protecting kids from anything? Because I just recall, sensitivity readers weren't a thing when I was a kid, but, but like censorious librarians and parents were. And there were various adult authority figures that tried to hide age inappropriate material from me. Stuff that I really should not have been reading. And I will tell you, it did not work at all. So I actually think one of the best ways for kids to encounter troubling ideas is through the veil of fiction. I think that when you're, you know, when you're processing something new that is scary, I know I learned a lot of things that I wasn't quite ready to think about as real in the context of particularly the kind of fiction that Roald Dahl writes, like the ridiculous, the absurd, this isn't, this isn't waiting for me under my bed, 
or is it? And that I, I think that taking that away from kids is, is probably a mistake. But of course, taking things away from kids is really always just the thin end of the wedge for taking it away from adults.